Um, so the final uh, keynote of this this uh, of this morning is going to be from someone called Joel. I think Joel is here. Is Joel not here? Yeah, you're here. You have a laptop. Oh, you're just going to speak it out. All right, I appreciate that. Well, without further ado, we have Joel talking about living unbanked. Um, you can take a mic here or you can use um, the one over there. Yeah, I'll take that. Enjoy. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. These are the last survivors of the apocalypse known as lunch. So I won't uh, bother you too much in keeping you away from your much needed nourishment. But because you are here, you're going to be test subjects. So first of all, Raise your hand if you've ever used cryptocurrency before. OK, that's almost everyone, as it should be. Now, who has ever actually bought or paid for a good or service that you'd normally use fiat currency for? How many have actually bought something or paid for something with crypto here? No, not in this case. Not in this case. OK, so about half. Now, how many people spend cryptocurrency on, again, regular goods and services that you would otherwise use your card for on a monthly basis, at least once a month? OK, still pretty strong. How about every single week? One and a half? We're getting fractional here. So, and we realize cryptocurrency has been out and exists for 14 years now, right? It's not necessarily early in the game, but at the same time, I understand because this is kind of the way I live my life and it can be a little difficult. So just the quick, my story, right? So for about the last 20 or so years, I've known that fiat currency was a scam. I've kind of known that inflation can destroy your savings, government control, all the good stuff that we know. And from an early age, I was sort of trying to figure out how to not live with my whole life savings and the money I use in a bad system. And so in the early days, like around 2010 or so, I was trying to get one of Euro Pacific Capital's gold-backed debit cards so I could spend and live on gold and all this stuff, which, you know, it's not something a lot of people can realistically use. Then about 2012, I heard about cryptocurrency and this thing called the Free State Project right around the same time, which the Free State Project is a move to get a bunch of people to move to one geographic location, namely New Hampshire, again, rep in the shirt right here, uh, in order to all focus on advancing human freedom in kind of a, it's kind of like a freedom hackathon, as it were. And so on my way moving out there, oh, I stopped in Chicago and a friend of mine, we shared a pizza and he, I paid for it and he paid me for his piece in Bitcoin, which I didn't know yet was uh, the stuff of legend as it, became, isn't, isn't pizza day coming up pretty soon here? Yeah, Monday, so very appropriate. And so for the next couple of years, I used cryptocurrency wherever I could. I tried to get paid in Bitcoin, I tried to use it, but it wasn't until the end of 2015 that I decided I was never going to be paid in fiat again. I just decided, you know, I've been playing around with this too much, I'm gonna just stop playing, I'm gonna start actually doing. And so I, since then, I have not earned fiat currency. It's been a long, almost eight years now, right? And the next year, around the middle of 2016, is when I closed my bank account. And so that was my life for a while. A few months after that, I had problems with Bitcoin because the block size. The blocks filled up, payments were taking a long time to go through, uh, things were getting expensive, like my $2 coffee was now $3, et cetera, et cetera. And so I had to switch. And so since then, my daily money, for the most part, about 80% or more is Dash, but I use a wide variety of cryptocurrencies, you know, anything that people will use. And so that's kind of my story of during this whole period of time. Now, why does it matter that people actually try to do something like this? Well, um, you can't really have freedom without financial freedom. And I know there's, there's a lot of theoretical things about 
what freedoms matter most, what about freedom of speech, what about freedom to defend yourself, things like that. The most realistic way someone can shut you up if you're saying something they don't agree with is to take away your ability to bank. If you can be debanked, it's it. Think about if you tomorrow were unable to use your bank card at all, or a bank account, or a payment app. Think about how would you get around? How would you use public transportation? How would you buy groceries? What would you eat? How would you make money? How would you do anything? You'd be basically rendered homeless almost instantly. And that is a massive amount of power that's in the hands of a very few institutions known as banks, and they are at the mercy of one entity, depending on the country you're in, a government. And so we have only the amount of freedom that our rulers allow us to have because we are on the banking system. And it's kind of interesting because there's so many people involved in cryptocurrency, but there's so few people using, and as an experiment, right? So about two days ago, I went to, there's an Indonesian takeout place in town here that takes Bitcoin. And of course, I went out of my way and I actually had a second dinner, you know, not complaining, it was good food, but just to go out of my way to patronize this place because they take Bitcoin. And, you know, thankfully for me, I guess, they use a static address and have for a while, so I was able to look up their entire transaction history because I know here at ETHDAM we're all about privacy, right? So I was able to look up their entire history of all the payments they received. Um, so two days ago, there's my payment. Uh, the one before that, October of last year. Before that, September. And before that, two years prior. This address has been receiving Bitcoin payments for eight years, a total of 21 payments during those eight years. And this is clearly a hardcore person here in town, right? And this kind of underscores just how little this is being used. And I understand why, because we are at the VC stage. We're at the stage where there's a lot of money going to a lot of projects, a lot of hackathons, a lot of really awesome things being built, and I mean, that's fantastic. It's a great seed stage. However, I believe we need to start acting like we're past that stage, even though we're not, because what we do informs what's being built. And so there's a lot of theory that goes out there. A lot of people say, oh, this can work that way, that can work this way, scaling this, uh, you know, privacy that, a lot of theory. It's easy to be theoretical if you never use it. And once you use it, then there goes the, the illusions. I've had people, for example, the specific case of Bitcoin, um, a lot of people thought like, oh, well, why didn't you start using Bitcoin Cash right away? It didn't exist for a whole year that my life was impacted by this. Some people had the luxury of paying once a month for something and saying, oh, $2 fee for Bitcoin, that's terrible. I, I, it's, but they still, they didn't have their life disrupted to the level that I was, that I had to switch a whole year before people even thought, oh, we need something different. And so what we build is informed by our realities. And I mean, I can't tell you how many days, go on Twitter, See poor Justin there just like losing his mind, talking about like, this is not right, this needs a change, and then people don't get it because they have a lot of money to build certain solutions, to build certain things, to basically live their lives on assumptions that they haven't actually battle tested. And so we're at, we're at a spot that's very unique in human history, right? This wasn't possible 10, 15, 20 years ago. We have the actual opportunity to have complete economic sovereignty and beyond for anyone in the world. Anyone can live permissionlessly. That creates an, a giant opportunity for true censorship resistance. People can't be censored very effectively if their money can't be censored. We're sitting on this giant opportunity. There's tons of money, but the money is going to dry up. And whatever happens, whatever we have left to show for all the money that's been pumped into the space, after it's all gone, that's what we have to work with. What if we build a castle on sand? What if we're building something on all kinds of different second, third layer networks, this and that, with no privacy, with no actual usability, with a bunch of censorship vectors, and then, oops, it doesn't work as intended, 
but we ran out of money to kind of work on that. Now we have to go back in the trenches. Now we have to go underground, et cetera. We have a giant opportunity that we could absolutely miss out on right now. So that would be kind of my message to you today, keeping it short here. Use it or lose it, right? If you're a developer, use it. Just try to make payments, try to mint NFTs, try to use them to token gate your whatever thing. Anything you're kind of doing, don't just do it in a sandbox environment, try to do it in real life. Go out and spend cryptocurrency. Go, go to this Indonesian place, Kadiri is the name by the way. Go to this place, spend Bitcoin there, and more importantly, just think about how little you know. You, you really find out how little you know in that action. Which wallet are you gonna use? Do you even know if they do Lightning or on-chain? How is it gonna work? How is, are you gonna have to wait for the person to be there to take it, et cetera, et cetera? Oh, there's confirmations. Oh, it, it, they give me a 10% discount, but the fee was more than the 10% discount. Oh, okay. You learn a lot of things really quick. So if you're building products, building services, you need to know what it ends up as and constantly refer back and forth to those points. This is the opportunity of a lifetime for the human race to take a giant step towards freedom. And I'm kind of worried that some of us might, or many of us, might be blowing it. Don't blow it. Start trying to live on crypto today. Yes, question. Yes. Yeah, so the quite yes. So the question was instead of just using direct cryptocurrencies, what if you use stable coins instead and then use them to fund traditional finance rails like Visa MasterCard, et cetera, and do it through that? Uh, there's a lot of nuance to maybe what the answer is, but we gotta think again, when you start thinking about things like that, you have to go back to what we're trying to achieve to begin with. First off, you want not your keys, not your crypto. You want something that you can control that someone can't just take from you, which of course is being highlighted with the whole ledger thing these days, but that's a different subject. So you want something that, you can't, that can't be rugged, right? So if you hold all your money in a stable coin, yes, I, kind of you can't be rugged unless it's a, unless it's say USDC, which will censor your payments, you know, which will actually will not let you send to certain addresses programmatically, right? So stable coins are a little mushy in that way, in that it depends on the stable coin, right? There's a lot more risk of that. And then, of course, the big thing about fiat, I mean, I understand speculative risk and all this kind of stuff. Number go up, number go down, number go every which way. However, fiat number go down, if I may say so. <laughs> fiat number go down. And more importantly, fiat number go down in a way that where it goes down goes to fund all kinds of horrible atrocities around the world. So I try to stay away from that personally as much as possible. That's more of a personal choice. But then also, the ability to transact um, privately, meaning, number one, without KYC, without revealing your identity. Obviously, that is virtually impossible for a regular person to view completely. But you can do that for a lot of your transactions. You know, your everyday coffee does not need to be attached to your identity, for example. And so, in those cases, yes, you could potentially, but it depends on the actual service, right? If it's a custodial KYC type car, like let's say a Coinbase card or whatever, or BitPay, um, they still have those, right? Um, where you have to just keep your funds in a balance on their custodial platform, and then whenever you swipe, you're escaping the one thing, which is the inflation, right? The, the inflation of the currency, the devaluation of the dollar, or the euro, whatever, but that's it. I think we can do a lot better than that. Um, I think that there are some services, right? Um, I'd have to brush up on my list of, depending on where in the world you are, there's one that's really great in the US called Spritz Finance, which lets you pay literally every single bill and has a prepaid card that you can use for everything. It is KYC, you do have to give your identity, 
but you never have to give control over your money. You just pay whenever you want. So even if the service rugs you, for example, uh, you still have all your money. So and they do accept stable coins, so if you don't want to deal with custodial risk, you can kind of do that. I'd probably diversify stable coins across a few platforms. But yeah, that's a, that's a better, if that's an interim solution, interim solution is a lot better than no solution. Going making one crypto payment a week is a lot better than none a year. One more question. One more question. Hi, thank you. Um, maybe not really a question, but more a um, point of discussion. Um, mm -hmm. I think I would kind of liken this to the movement towards zero waste. Um, if you've heard the statement, we don't need a few people doing zero waste perfectly, but a lot of people doing zero waste imperfectly. And I would see that also for um, what you mentioned as well. This is not to disparage or to bring down the value of what you do. Like I really admire that on a very principled level. Um, but I do think there is something to be said about, for example, um, insisting on transacting with my friend. Let's say I, I, we've gone out to dinner and he, and he paid and I want to transfer him money and I do this via USDC on um, Polygon or something. And yeah. in this case, like I cut out, instead of doing this via the bank, like via a bank transfer or doing this via PayPal, where I would also pay, you know, zero fees, arguably less than a couple of, you know, like 0 0.00 cents that I would pay on Polygon to do it. I'm also cutting out the middleman. I'm also preventing um, the centralization point of um, currency transfer and you're right, there is still inherent risk in the USDC versus that point of if I were to do it on um, using Bitcoin, for example, or like a truly um, decentralized asset. Um, but, you know, it's I don't think this kind of I don't think this diverges from the take that you had just now. But yeah, absolutely. I would kind of clarify that what I do doesn't make sense. Like, I, I think it does. Like, it, I, like it, it does in the sense that we need someone that pioneers that spirit that says, like, you can do it. Yeah, as, a, as the great Ken Bozak once said, we're the beta testers of money. It sucks. And so that's kind of what, I'm, what I do is I force myself into an uncomfortable position so I can find my way out of it, right? As in, how am I going to pay for things if I don't have a bank account? I don't know until I'm in that, I don't need to know until I'm at, in that position, and then I learn. And that knowledge not only informs developers, like I talk to a lot of wallet providers, ecosystem providers, I beta test a whole lot of products in the crypto space for spending, and because I have that firsthand experience of what works and what doesn't, but also I kind of, I can tell, I would say everyone, in, I am relatively confident I could tell everyone in this room how to make one regular payment in crypto, no ma almost no matter where in the world they are. And that's because I've kind of gone through the learning process of doing this. So as far as like the, the zero waste analogy, that's absolutely correct. The problem was we have everyone doing all waste, right? Almost everyone, again, this is a great crowd here. There's a lot of people that use crypto here, but this almost everyone does almost nothing regularly in crypto as far as a payment. And when you have people that do everything, they have enough knowledge to then be able to say, hey, what's, hey, you said you don't pay this. I can figure out how, how you can actually do that. And then, oh, great. And then everyone starts to do just a little bit, but you kind of need that, that comprehensive goal, that comprehensive picture, because it's like, it's, it's always like kind of you know, pyramid shape, right? There's always a few insane people like me at the very top or the very bottom of your, your kind of a perspective. And then each person with like less lifetime flexibility, less time to learn, et cetera, is always up. But if the most radical people are the people that like, oh yeah, every once in a while I buy a plane ticket so I can post about it on Twitter and stuff, if that's the, to if that's the top, what's the rest of the pyramid looking like? It's n no good. So it, to answer your point, yeah. Thank you. All right, you good?